cold December afternoon in modern-day South Dakota, members of the Lakota tribe, the people once known as the Teton Sioux, saddle their horses and ride. They ride to remember, to remember the great chiefs and warriors of the past, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, Red Cloud and Bigfoot. They ride to remember the tragic years after Custer and the Little Bighorn, when the blazing fire of victory quickly turned to ash. Pursued by troops and forced onto reservations, the Lakotas and their friends and allies, the Cheyennes, were told that the only way they could survive was to obliterate all traces of their way of life. They must kill the Indian in them to save the man. But all this brought was misunderstanding, despair, and death. They want us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. They don't know that moccasins do not have bootstraps. Most important, these Lakotas ride to remember men, women, and children who lost their lives at this place more than 100 years ago. A place where all the anguish and distrust came to a flashpoint, and the frontier west was lost for good. Wounded knee. Five months since the death of Custer and his men at the Little Bighorn, the citizens of the United States, shocked as they had not been since the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, demand punishment. The Lakotas and the Northern Cheyennes in that great village on the Little Bighorn uh, could not have had any sense of uh, the reaction of the American people to what happened on the Little Bighorns. They were minding their own business in that little Bighorn Valley when they were fallen upon by a whole regiment of cavalry under General Custer. They were the aggrieved parties, and uh, they would have had no sense of the sense of grievance that the American people felt uh, at the loss of uh, so large a portion of Custer's command. The army was off in hot pursuit. Any Lakotas or Northern Cheyennes off the reservation, whether they had fought against Custer or not, are to surrender and return, or face the consequences. Sitting Bull and his followers flee to Canada. Others split into smaller groups and try to vanish into the mountains and valleys. Still, the soldiers come. Little Wolf, a great chief of the Northern Cheyennes, wants no war. But when Custer fell, Little Wolf and his people were off the reservation headed for the great camp on the Little Bighorn. They arrived just hours after the big battle. Another chief of the Northern Cheyennes, Dull Knife, had been a famous warrior in his youth. Now he too wants peace. But some of his men had fought at the Little Bighorn. Dull Knife leads his people to safety in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. They are joined there by Little Wolf and his band. But 
they are not safe. On November 25, 1876, over a thousand cavalry, led by Colonel Ranald McKenzie, attack. Most of the Cheyennes manage to escape, but 40 lose their lives, and all their teepees and food supplies are destroyed. Dull Knife is the great-grandfather of Ted Rising Sun. For the first time, they began to consider surrendering. And they watched the camp go up in flames. They saw their horse herd slaughtered. They heard the screams of the horses whose throats had been cut. I know I would be furious. I would be... I would be justified in killing somebody. But that's, that's war. Army Private William Earl Smith, one of the soldiers at the Dull Knife Battle, writes a poem. We soon overtook them as frightened they fled, cut off the long hair that they wore on their head. No mercy, no mercy, so loud was our cry. Have vengeance for Custer, brave soldiers, or die. The anger of the Northern Cheyennes is no match for the relentless soldiers in the harsh winter. Come spring, Dull Knife and Little Wolf surrender. They think they will be given a reservation in this, their homeland. But Little Wolf and Dull Knife are told that they and their people will be sent south to the Indian Territory, now the state of Oklahoma, far away from the land they treasure. All you have to do is look around here and you can see how beautiful this, this, this valley was and the White River Valley. And, and, and even today there's an abundance of game and, and it was a way of life that, that, you know, that the people cherished. If you've grown up and you know you've lived that way for generations and then all of a sudden your life changes and, and you know you're, you're you're put on a reservation in Oklahoma and you know the weather's different the, the, the trees are different the grass is different you know the, the even the people are different you know you you feel you, you feel like you know a part of you has just been taken away Life in the Indian Territory is an unending nightmare. Already meager rations and goods are stretched to virtual non-existence. Meat is spoiled and rotten. The climate is hot and miserable. The stench overpowering. Being weakened by malnutrition, they began to get sick and fell prey to the diseases of the Southland. And that's when they began to pressure their leaders, take us home. We want to go home. We can't live down here. Famine and disease, malaria, dysentery. In the first two months, 70 die of measles and starvation. The repeated pleas of Little Wolf and Dull Knife to head back to the north are rejected by the government. Finally, in September 1878, they take matters into their own hands. Nearly 300 Cheyennes escape into the surrounding sand hills, heading back to Wyoming and Montana. Orders to return to the reservation are ignored. Little Wolf sends a message. We are going back north as it was promised we might when we consented to come down to this country. There the hunting is good, the water is pure, heat not great and little sickness and death among our children. We intend to go peacefully without injuring or destroying any property of the white man on the way. And we will attack no one unless we are first molested. Dull Knife's daughter, the grandmother of Ted Rising Sun, is one of those who fled. She used to say, why did they do that to us when we were only coming home. She couldn't understand why. 
They would be shot at, harassed, when all they were doing was coming home. Tears used to run down her face when she said this, when she told these stories. For three months, more than 10,000 troops searched for an elusive 278 Cheyennes. First of all, you have to think about a determined people. They're interested in getting back to their home, and they're going to try to do anything they can to get back to their home, but also very sophisticated travelers. They knew how to use the horse better than anybody ever did uh, in, in, in the Americas. And they traveled at night, and they traveled quickly. They could cover 50, 60 miles um, a night with little or no problem. It is an astonishing 1,500-mile exodus, but weariness and diminishing supplies take a toll. Little Wolf and Dull Knife split up, Little Wolf heading on toward Montana with the younger Cheyennes, Dull Knife planning a quick run to the Pine Ridge Agency in Dakota Territory. There, he will ask that his people be taken in by Red Cloud and the Lakotas. Once again, winter is the worst enemy. In a howling December storm, Dull Knife's band, 149 men, women, and children, are discovered by the Army. They are taken to Fort Robinson, Nebraska, and confined to a barracks building. Soon, Dull Knife learns that his people will be returned once again to the hated Indian Territory. Captain Henry Wessels, the commander of Fort Robinson, is warned by Dull Knife. Tell the Great Father that Dull Knife and his people ask only to end their days here in the North where they were born. We cannot live in the South. Tell him if he lets us stay here, Dull Knife and his people will hurt no one. Tell him, if he tries to send us back, we will butcher each other with our own knives. Wessel's response is to cut off the barracks' rations of food, water, and firewood to force the Cheyennes into compliance. He has underestimated their determination. They were all together, you know, it was like all one mind. When you make that kind of resolution about, you know, what you're going to do with your life or, you know, how you're going to, you know, how, you know, what's going to happen, sometimes there's a lot of relief. And so I would imagine that some of those people were, were relieved that, that, you know, that they were going to, you know, that they were going to die. January 9th, 1879. As dusk falls, warriors in the crowded barracks pry up floorboards and remove hidden ammunition and guns, including a carbine captured at the Little Bighorn. A lot of the children are crying. I remember my great-grandmother talking about a dream she had just before, just before they broke out, about being cold and she was hungry. Her grandpa and her grandma were, were there and, and she woke up and she was crying and, and he, you know, he, her grandpa was holding her and her grandma was holding her and telling her not to cry and, and she said there were people were singing their death songs. Shots ring out and the Cheyennes make a last desperate attempt to escape. They are hopelessly outnumbered but it doesn't matter. Death is better than captivity. This Cheyenne woman's father-in-law, Three Fingers, was a six-year-old boy inside the barracks. Immediately, the soldiers opened fire and began shooting at the Cheyenne people. They scattered in all directions. Three Fingers and his mother took off toward the hill, and Three Fingers' mother got shot in the back and fell over. She told her son, keep running, they have killed me. The survivors head for the White River and the River Bluffs, but by morning, 30 Cheyennes are dead and 35 taken prisoner. Over the next weeks, most will be captured or die. 
I suppose from the white viewpoint you could look at, on it as a, a rather stupid decision, a suicidal decision. Uh, but in retrospect, uh, we have to pay great tribute uh, to these people uh, to uh, form the resolve that they did and then to carry it out. At the same time, we have to be very critical of government policies that were so inflexible that they could not adjust to the spirit of these people and uh, to um, military uh, practices on the local level which were not very well thought out. The reality of what happened here was that, that this was the end of the Cheyenne people as a fighting nation. You know, our people were, were so decimated and so destroyed that only what you had left was remnants of a people. To the north, Little Wolf receives the news of the Fort Robinson outbreak and its deadly outcome with helpless horror. Eventually, he and Dull Knife and the tiny handful of Cheyennes, who miraculously have thwarted all manner of disaster, are allowed to settle on reservations in the north. It is all they had ever wanted. They no doubt loved their homeland just as as we love America today. And they were willing to fight for it, to die for it, to make any sacrifice. In 1879, when the Northern Cheyennes make their futile flight for freedom from Fort Robinson, virtually all of their friends among the Teton Sioux, the Lakotas, have resigned themselves to life on the reservation. All but the defiant Hunk Papa Sioux and their leader, the Great Sitting Bull. From his sanctuary in Canada, Sitting Bull views the American reservation system with disdain. Asked to return to the United States, he bluntly replies, If you think me a fool, you are a bigger fool than I am. But even one as powerful as Sitting Bull cannot overcome bitter reality. Buffalo are as rare as they are below the border. The Canadians have trouble feeding their own native people, much less the exile Hunkpapas. With each passing year, more and more of Sitting Bull's followers quietly slip back south to the reservation. Finally, uneasily, Sitting Bull joins them. His surrender on July 20, 1881 at Fort Buford can be seen as marking the final collapse uh, of Lakota resistance to the westward movement. With Sitting Bull's return to the reservation, there are no more free Lakota. They are all reservation Lakota. At long last, the government can truly say there are no independent Lakota bands that can cause trouble for government policies. Sitting Bull is brought to Dakota's Standing Rock Agency, as contentious as ever. He repeatedly comes head to head with the equally stubborn James McLaughlin, Standing Rock's government appointed boss. I do not wish to be shut up in a corral. All agency Indians I have seen were worthless. They are neither red warriors nor white farmers. They are neither wolf nor dog. But. My followers are weary of cold and hunger. They wish to see their brothers in their old home. Therefore, I bow my head. McLaughlin has to contend not only with Sitting Bull's popularity on the reservation, but around the world. In 1885, Buffalo Bill Cody signed Sitting Bull as a star attraction in his flamboyant Wild West show. Sitting Bull is impressed with much of what he sees as he tours the country.
but appalled by the poverty he sees in the cities. The white man knows how to make everything, but he does not know how to distribute it. More often than not, any chance to get the white man's goods distributed fairly to the Lakota peoples is hampered by ineptitude and gross corruption. By the late 1880s, people were starving. We lost 90% of our population to starvation. There was inadequate food supply. There was no lives, to, no wild uh, game to hunt. The, pre, the Great Plains antelope had been hunted to extinction. The buffalo was almost killed to extinction. Some of the last bears were killed. The running of uh, cattle was destroying the native grasses. It was a time of total desperation. We were at the absolute mercy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs agent. Their way of life is further disrupted by the well-meaning, if wrong-headed, good intentions of the Indian reform movement. Reformers see the reservation system not only as a way to keep the Lakotas and other tribes out of the way of Western expansion, but as a social incubator that will hatch Indians into civilized white folk. A leader of the reform movement is the Reverend Lyman Abbott. The Indians can scarcely be said to have occupied this country more than the bisons and buffalo they hunted. 300,000 people have no right to hold a continent and keep at bay a race able to people it and provide the happy home of civilization. It's one of these situations where with friends like this who needs enemies, that's, that's what you end up with with the reformers. Their intentions might have been good, but again, their impact in Indian communities is absolutely disastrous. In terms of the time it takes for societies to evolve to a certain point, uh, the sudden change brought on by reservations was literally overnight. It was decided that since all civilized people are Christians, the Sioux had to not only be civilized but Christianized. You had to become a farmer and become a Christian. All of this was for the good of the Indians, because if the Indians kept on the way they were, they would disappear. So the, in Richard Henry Pratt, a famous Indian reformer's phrase, what they had to do was kill the Indian and save the man. As an army officer, Richard Pratt had been an Indian fighter and prison warden. Seized by the zeal of the reform movement, he now believes that the only way to save the Indians is to turn them into land-tilling, patriotic, God-fearing Christians, and that the best vehicle for this is education. It wasn't an education, it was an indoctrination. We were uh, forbidden to speak our language, we were forbidden to even think about or talk about anything that related to our culture. And I guess the theory was that if you could destroy the language, and destroy the beliefs and the culture by teaching these children that everything their grandparents did was wrong or evil, you're gonna eventually be able to take these children and assimilate them and acculturate them into the mainstream. Even more extreme is the reformer's attitude toward the Native Americans' religious beliefs. For the Lakotas, the restrictions are especially grating. Ceremonies, the work of the medicine men, and worst of all, the central ritual of Lakota faith, the sun dance, are forbidden. We find that as Indian people to be really uh, an irony in that a lot of the settlers came over here to get away from persecution of, of, uh, for their religious beliefs in Europe and they turned right around and did the same thing to the indigenous peoples here. And then, the whites demand more land. If the Lakotas are to become simple farmers, the reasoning goes, surely they would not need all the land they had in their Great Sioux Reservation. Fewer than 10,000 Lakotas live on more than 43,000 square miles, 
an area slightly larger than the state of Ohio. Well, they came out and they told about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not terrorize. They preached that to the Asian people while at the same time the government was behind them trying to get all the land it can and all the resources of the land. The Lakotas resist, but the government has an ace up its sleeve, Major General George Crook. In 1889, he wangles the Lakotas into giving up nine million acres of land. The Great Sioux Reservation is divided into six smaller reservations. It is impossible to exaggerate the psychological effect of that uh, land agreement on the Lakotas. On top of a decade of afflictions and frustration and cultural breakdown, the land agreement was uh, the uh, ultimate blow to the Sioux. It made them ripe for some kind of a social or religious upheaval. Throughout human history, when all else has failed, people have prayed for miracles. For the disconsolate Lakotas, hope suddenly shines from the West. Eighteen ninety, in the November nineteenth edition of the Omaha World Herald, right below an advertisement for Radway's pain reliever appears a small headline announcing the new Christ of the Indians. In that news lurks the seed of the final outburst of the Indian Wars. From the deserts of Nevada to the plains of Dakota, word travels of an Indian messiah. His name is Wovoka. The Lakotas send two of their medicine men, Short Bull and Kicking Bear, to investigate. The people were very threatened. Their lives were threatened. Their lifestyle was threatened. And in that desperation, they looked for some kind of hope, and that was the glimmer of hope that they found. The Indian Messiah gave tribes all over the West hope. Uh, he gave none more hope than he gave to uh, elements of the Lakota because they had been brought to a higher peak of uh, frustration, disillusionment, and hopelessness than uh, any other tribe in the West. Wovoka is a sheep herder and sometime shaman. During a total eclipse of the sun, he has a vision of a new world. It was uh, a uh, teaching that drew very heavily on Christian principles as well as upon uh, traditional Indian beliefs. In fact, he uh, uh, exhibited scars on his hands and feet where centuries ago the white people had nailed him to a cross. Wovoka preaches that there will come a time when all the native people will be happy once more, when food will be plentiful and all the whites will disappear. His teaching was basically peace, try to get along with everyone, try to treat everybody in a good way. And you treat people in a good way, they'll treat you in a good way in return. And to, for you, when you cross over to the other world, you know, you'd be ready. Wovoka says that essential to getting to that other world is a special ghost dance that must be danced for hours and days until ghosts of the dead and glimpses of the promised land come into view. For the Lakotas, desperate to grasp at any shred of hope, 
The ghost dance spreads like a prairie fire. People dance into trances and convulsions. Some have a more spiritual experience than the grandmother of Alice New Holy. She said she went around and around. She said pretty soon she got dizzy and she fell down. And she said uh, she never seen anybody. She's looking around to see if you know, one of her dead relatives you know, would, would come to her. And she said all she got was a big headache. So she don't believe in that. But to the peaceful teachings of Wavoka, the Lakotas add a streak of militancy. Kicking Bear tells his people, All men and women make holy shirts and dresses to wear in the dance. The ghosts say that the bullets will not go through these shirts and dresses. So they have these dresses for war. Fall 1890. Sounds of the ghost dance are echoing off the Dakota Badlands. Followers of the ghost dance are especially strong at the Pine Ridge and Rosebud reservations. The fervor probably would dance itself out. But the Indian agent at Pine Ridge, a political hack named Daniel Royer, panics. Royer, who the Lakotas call young man afraid of Indians, bombards Washington with telegrams, begging for military assistance. Police force are overpowered and disheartened. We have no protection, and they're at the mercy of these crazy dancers. Finally, on orders of President Benjamin Harrison, General Nelson Bearcoat Miles sends troops to Pine Ridge and Rosebud. Frightened ghost dancers literally head for the hills, holing up at a hideaway in the Dakota Badlands called the Stronghold. Once again, the American public is stirred into an Indian fearing frenzy. And once again, their fears are fueled by screaming headlines. Accompanying the army, there had been a uh, whole army of war correspondents uh, who came to Pine Ridge and had nothing to write about. Uh, and so simply gathered each day and compiled uh, sensationalist dispatches to send to the outside world. So the newspapers trumpeted a war that in fact did not exist either in reality or in prospect. Fall turns into winter, the time the Lakotas call the moon of popping trees. From the Standing Rock Reservation, Sitting Bull watches the ghost dance mania with great interest. He has experimented with the dance, but cannot accept a religion founded upon the teachings of Christianity. I do not know what to believe. If I could dream like the others and visit the spirit world myself, then it would be easy to believe, but the trance does not come to me. It passes me by. I cannot give up my Indian race and habits. But Standing Rock's agency boss, James McLaughlin, believes the ghost dance is just Sitting Bull's kind of mischief. He orders Sitting Bull's arrest. Dawn, December 15, 1890. Hearing that Sitting Bull is planning to join the ghost dancers at the stronghold, McLaughlin sends 43 Lakota policemen led by Henry Bullhead to Sitting Bull's log cabin on the Grand River. Sitting Bull was not afraid, one of the policemen said. We were afraid. Bullhead, Red Tomahawk and others enter the cabin and arrest Sitting Bull. An angry crowd of Sitting Bull's followers gathers outside and tries to keep the police from taking their leader away. A shot is fired. Bullhead is hit. But as he falls, both he and Red Tomahawk shoot Sitting Bull dead. Whether or not they intentionally had Sitting Bull killed, um, it certainly fit into the scheme of things that he, that he was killed. It took away that, 
that possibility of Sitting Bull being supportive and giving an impetus to the ghost dance movement. As long as he was here, the people would always still have that hope and the desire to continue to fight for who they were as a people, you know, and for their nation. And with him out of the way, kill the leader. You can subdue their people a lot easier than if you let him live, because he would always be a great champion of our people for as long as he lived. His death uh, emerges as a powerful symbol marking the end of one era, the era of the westward movement, the era of the frontier, the era of Indian independence, and the beginning of another, the beginning of uh, the 20th century and all that that implied different uh, for American history. But there is one last tragic scene still to be played. With the death of Sitting Bull and the government's still escalating ghost dance hysteria, terrified Lakotas find themselves in flight once again. Sitting Bull's people run for the Cheyenne River Reservation and the kind sanctuary of its chief, Bigfoot. You helped all people so that if there were widows, if there were people that were elderly, if there were people that were sick, unable to care for themselves, they came to his band and they took him in and they helped him survive. Bigfoot and all the Lakotas now at Cheyenne River are labeled hostiles. Bigfoot's arrest is ordered. Even though he suffers from pneumonia, Bigfoot leads the people on one more run for what he hopes will be the safety of Pine Ridge. He has another reason for going there as well. Bigfoot was uh, known uh, among all of the Lakota as a, a successful conciliator, one who had special uh, skills at making peace. And the chiefs down at Pine Ridge had invited him to come down there and help make peace with the army. Bigfoot guides the people through the Badlands toward Pine Ridge. My grandfather would tell me how his mother and his aunt often spoke about walking in the December cold and how she cried because Sitting Bull had been killed and she cried because she thought they would all be killed and she cried because she wondered if she would ever live enough, long enough to have children and if her children would have great-grandchildren, and if those great-grandchildren of her children would be Lakota. And as she cried, her tears froze to her face. December 28, 1890. Bigfoot is discovered by a squadron of Custer's old 7th Cavalry. Bigfoot agrees to go with them to their camp about 20 miles from Pine Ridge in the valley of Wounded Knee Creek. There the troops and the 350 Lakotas are joined by the rest of the 7th Cavalry, led by Colonel James Forsyth. The Lakota encampment is totally surrounded. The next day, the 29th, is uncommonly warm for December. Forsyth orders the Lakotas to turn over their weapons. The military had been ordered to disarm Bigfoot and take him out of the country because he was still thought to be a troublemaker. But the process of disarming Indians, historically, time after time it has happened in the past, is guaranteed to unleash tensions that rise and uh, may not be containable. 
In those times, uh, guns were like gold to the Indians. It was a means of survival. It was a means of obtaining food. Not so much for self-defense, not so much for killing or murdering, or taking other people's lives, but it was for survival of food. There is resistance. A medicine man exhorts the ghost dancers among them to defy the order, reminding them that their ghost shirts render them invulnerable to white bullets. It is the final confrontation of the Lakotas and Custer's 7th Cavalry. One of the soldiers appeared to be the one in charge, and he barked an order. All of the soldiers slid cartridges into the chambers. But my grandfather said it was almost instantly. He said there was another loud command, and at that point in time, uh, it just seemed like the thunders in the sky opened up. As the shot rang out, all the guns fired as one. Grandpa Beard used to say that he described the gun shooting as if you would take a piece of canvas and just tear it slowly. Who fires first remains a source of fierce debate to this day, but the horrific end result is indisputable. The smoke was about to tie off the ground, you can't say nothing. And the Heidi uncle, sitting right in the middle of that first violin, killed Bigfoot and my grandfather right there. And he was shot right through the heart of my chest, and I went right through. The howitzers were firing at, at that time, and they were just shooting right into the, the people. And he saw a lot of soldiers fall. But these soldiers uh, were in line of fire from the other side. So, you know, he felt that there were a lot of them that had shot each other. There's a ravine right on the coast, and they, all those kids, were heading for that ravine, and they followed him and shut him down. And the kids cried a little bit. Their mother tried to grab them, and they shot him right down on top of the kids and all that. When the shooting at Wounded Knee finally stops, 25 soldiers, more than 200 Lakotas, and Bigfoot are dead. Later that day, Lakota holy man Black Elk comes upon the scene. Dead and wounded women and children and little babies were scattered all along there where they had been trying to run away. Sometimes they were in heaps because they had all huddled together, and some were scattered all along. I saw a little baby trying to suck its mother, but she was bloody and dead. It was a good winter day when this happened, but after the soldiers marched away from their dirty work, a heavy snow began to fall. Four days later, a working party headed by a man named Paddy Starr arrives at the site. Paid two dollars a body, they bury the Lakotas in a mass grave.
Bill Horncloud's father survives the carnage of that day, but eight other members of the Horncloud family are killed. It's quite a, quite a saint when you realize that you will never see them again in this life. So, the while I'm talking about this, I, the only solution I could receive would be to offer my prayers to the Great Spirit who is taking care of us when he put us on this continent. And that way I feel a little better by saying a prayer for my relatives who are buried here. With the guns silenced at wounded knee, four centuries of major armed conflict between Native Americans and white settlers come to an end. In that sense, the West is finally, decidedly lost. But nothing has ever killed the spirit. The dream did not die at Wounded Knee. It has continued. That's why I'm alive, that's why many of my Lakota people are alive. What the future holds is a dream. As long as we live, as long as we continue to pray, we will continue and the dreams of our ancestors will never die.